and we can go ahead and get started. You ready? Yeah, let's do this. Yeah. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to 100 Degrees of Entrepreneurship. I am joined today by perhaps our most special guest yet. Uh, Susie Hauk is one of the CFOs on the 100 Degrees team, and I have Susie here on the show with me. Welcome, Susie. Hey, Stephanie. Thanks for having me, and I'm super excited to talk to everybody. Yes. So this is the very first time that we've ever had anybody from our team on the show before. And I just thought it would be really a, like a fun series to kind of talk to different members of our team and learn about your background and your career path and what you do to help serve our clients and what you love about your work and maybe what you don't love about your work and just kind of go a little bit more, um, yeah, a little bit deeper because I think that our listeners hear a lot from me about what it's like to be a CFO, but, um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear from some other people as well. And, um, our team is, is awesome. So anyway, Susie, tell us, um, tell us a little bit about your like career path. Have you always worked in, um, you know, in finance, what has that looked like for you? Yeah, so um, I guess my career in finance started when I was probably in middle school, and I started uh, getting really interested in business and numbers, finance and accounting. Um, I remember distinctly making a sales presentation to my parents that they should uh, do one thing rather than another. Um, my my <laughs> parents were in Amway growing up, if you, you know, were mm -hmm. a, a child of the 90s. Um, so I was already <laughs> surrounded by a business type culture. Uh, and I remember like being surrounded by that. My parents were listening to tapes and videos about business and entrepreneurship all the time. So I was sort of in it from the beginning. Um, yeah. And then I went to college, kind of dabbled around in international business, as well as uh, I thought maybe I wanted to be a teacher for a while and decided that wasn't a good thing. Um, and we ended up going into agricultural business. So I focused my degree in, um, yeah, in business with an ag focus. I'm from Iowa. And so that makes a lot of sense for our area. Um, and then after college, I got involved in nonprofit, actually, an agricultural nonprofit and spent about 15 years at Practical Farmers of Iowa learning and growing with the business as the organization grew over time. Um, and it was great because I got to work with farmers who are small business people, as well as manage the finances of an organization. So I've kind of got, I've got the entrepreneurship and nonprofit as well. So yeah, that's kind of where I started from and how I grew into it. That's so cool. Um I did not know the piece about your parents and the sort of entrepreneur as a kid kind of thing. Did you ever have any like little micro businesses as a kid? Did you like sell stuff or anything like that? Oh, Walk oh, dogs. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, my, we actually did farmer's market. And so I helped my dad grow and sell produce for farmer's market. And then that branched off into things like taking orders for pies and then distributing, baking them and then distributing them. I made pot holders at one point. Um, yes. I did a couple different international missions trip during high school. And so I'd make like money on the side to try and make uh, the expenses for those international trips. And yeah, kind of entrepreneurship from the very beginning, I guess. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I don't think I knew that, that side about the entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneurial starts. Um, yeah, I was definitely the same way. I've, I think I've mentioned before on the podcast, so our listeners may know, but like I did all the things, had the lemonade stands. I was just telling, um, our last guest, we were talking about our entrepreneurial ventures and I used to make, um, I used to like, we would go to once a year, we go to like the Jersey shore for vacation. And so I would collect seashells. And I would paint the inside of the seashells with nail polish and then sell them as <laughs> ashtrays, which is like, I feel like that is really dating me. This was like early nineties because I mean, my parents didn't even smoke. So it was like, uh, but you know, people in the neighborhood did so like, here, come buy they my seashell them, yeah. ashtray. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't think kids are selling ashtrays anymore, but, um, yeah. That's so funny. Um, that's so cool. Okay. So you spent, um, so you spent 15 years at this nonprofit organization. Were you always like managing their finances or were you ever in any different roles there? Any like program roles or anything like that, or just pretty much all finance? 
So always administration type focused. I didn't spend any specific time in program, um, but I will say when the organization was small, when I first started out, I ended up doing some programming just because everybody wore all the different hats. Um, so the, the organization was about a million a year when I first started. So I ended up doing some programming based on my interests. I ran the poultry program. I ran the youth program. I ran kind of on the side, but I started off as the um, office manager and membership services coordinator. So lots of donor management, acknowledgements, um, that sort of office management type stuff, I guess, um, and did that for about nine months. And then they realized, oh, she actually has a finance background. At that point, we were contracting out the finance services to another um, organization, not not similar to 100 Degrees, but kind of the model that we handle right now. Um, and so once I got in and kind of got my feet wet at the organization, they realized, oh, Susie can actually do this instead of paying a contractor to do it. So at that point, we brought the finances back in-house. Um, and then I was doing office management and the finances and then focused more and more on the finances and administration as the organization continued to grow. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I see, you know, I see that with our clients and some former clients as well. Like we really sort of look to whether they are outsourcing their finance function or whether they bring it in house, like when they bring it in house, we look at that as like a major milestone for the organization. Um, even though it's like essentially putting us out of a job, you know, they they leave yeah. us as a client, like that's a goal, right. Is that they can bring that finance function in house. And that was great that they were able to, um, yeah, able to kind of shift that over to you. So, um, I would love to hear like, so you've been with 100 degrees at this point for how long, when did you start with us again? Uh, end of February. So let's see. Okay. So like five months, um, five months. Yep. yeah. Oh my gosh. So how is it, you know, how is it working since you were the one organization for a really long time and now you've come into this new role where you've got, um, lots of different clients all at once. How is that? Was that like a, um, you know, sort of like like a shock to your system or was it like a kind of a fun new challenge? And you can say that it was a shock to your system. If it was. <laughs> well, uh, both. Can I answer that way? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I will say it's a shock to my system because it isn't just one organization in the weeds all the time. And um, in the organization that I was in, I really under I was sitting on the executive team as well as the leadership team. And so I was hearing all about the business all the time, um, really in depth on program, even though I wasn't necessarily involved in the program. So that's been kind of a shock to not fully understand the programs of the organizations that I'm working with mm -hmm. and how that impacts the finances. Um, but I will say it's been really fun. Um, it's really fun to get to work with lots of different people on lots of different things. Um, so in one day I can work from I can work with somebody in Malawi or not in Malawi, but working on stuff in Malawi to Texas, to Nicaragua, to, you know, California, to the East Coast. Like I'm getting so much more breadth of understanding of the work of nonprofits and what they're doing. Um, not that it was bad to focus on one thing, but I'm really enjoying hearing and supporting lots of different organizations doing lots of really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think like our work definitely lends itself to people that love variety. Like you definitely won't do the same thing over and over again. I mean, it's interesting though, cause our work is very cyclical, right? Like we have a monthly, like a monthly routine, a monthly bookkeeping, a monthly finance cycle that like we do the same thing month after month, but at least I found that one of the things that keeps me from not getting bored, cause I'm somebody that does definitely get bored kind of easily, um, mm -hmm. is like that variety of clients that we work with. And in addition to like our monthly, the sort of monthly finance routine, there's always like those other things, um, kind of popping up that keep things fresh and keep things new and whatever. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. And I forgot you really, your client portfolio is really global. I kind of forgot some of the clients that you're working with. So you're right. You're, you're all over the place. Um, yeah. How fun. What it's would you really say? fun to get to, oh, I'm sorry. It's really fun no, to but... get to 
to work in different time zones. Um, that's not something that I ever really had to experience with practical farmers of Iowa. Um, yeah. Cause we were all just Iowa based and all doing our own thing. Um, but it's really fun to get to, to talk to people in different States and across the globe and um, work with, yeah, different time zones, even in the challenge that comes with that. So it's something new that I never thought that I would do. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can imagine, especially cause I, well, I don't know exactly where you live in Iowa, nor do I know a lot about Iowa, but I would imagine that there's not like a whole, like a, a lot, a great number of, um, global nonprofit organizations in Iowa. No, maybe nope, I'm wrong, definitely not. but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Like, I don't know. I don't want to make judgments on Iowa because I've never been there before and I don't know, but it would seem that there would not be a whole lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say in, you know, in thinking about the work that we do, like clearly, you know, I, I think a lot of people think about finance and accounting as like this boring thing that like, you don't want to have to deal with. It's just like, a you know, a sort of a nuisance and necessity. You and I love it. Like it's the work that we do. It's the work that lights us up, but that doesn't mean that we love every single minute or every single little task about what we do. Um, what would you say are like the tasks or the parts of the work that we do that you're like, not a huge fan of, but maybe you just, you know, it's got to get done, but you're not the biggest fan. Yeah. Um, well, coding thousands and thousands of transactions is not necessarily <laughs> fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, there is there is some manual tasks like data entry specifically, or like double checking that a formula is right so the analysis comes across correctly, and why isn't something tying? Like, there are times where you're just kind of like, this is really frustrating, but you know at the end of the day that that work is worth it and it helps make decisions for people. Um, I, I love the number part of it um, because I have always said that you can't make good decisions unless you know your numbers and understand your numbers well. And you don't necessarily have to nerd out on the finances, but you really can't make a good decision on whether you should hire somebody or not if you don't know your top line and your bottom line revenue. Um, you can't make a good decision on whether you should expand a business or contract a business or is something actually mission focused, like a gut feeling is okay. And that helps in some situations, but, um, but solid numbers that you actually can rely on helps, helps make decision-making so much easier. So yeah, some of those manual transactions and Excel data monkeying, I guess, for lack of a better word is, is worth it in the end. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I, um, for as much as I am a numbers person, I'm not like an excruciating, like detail oriented person. Like I'm detail oriented, like when it matters, but like to have to comb through scads of data looking for like five cents, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing that. <laughs> like yeah. that is, that's painful. So yeah, yeah, I'm totally with you, but you're right. The power that numbers can hold for our clients, for leaders. I think it's, um, it's so huge. Have you ever experienced like a, I feel like I've heard it called a mission moment where you just have this like connection to the mission of the organization and in some way that really impacted you. And so maybe that was it. I mean, since you've only been with us for five months now, maybe it was at practical farmers. Have you, is there a mission moment that you've had that you can share with us? Um, am I allowed to say client data? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Okay. Like say like the name like, of a can client? I, can I say a name, a, a name of a client? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. So a recent situation, we're working with a client called the Sonder project and they work in Malawi and Burkina Faso and in lots of different areas, but specifically in drilling wells. Um, and they're working through the process of drilling these wells, but then also are trying out filters and in places where um, it might not be, like there might not be a densely populated enough area to have a, a well that's worth it. People would still have to walk. They're trying these filters. Um, and it, it connected with me because in Iowa, we also have a lot of water quality issues for different reasons. Um, and 
completely different water quality issues, but there are a lot of health connection issues with farmers and other people in rural areas um, where there might not be a big enough area for a fancy water treatment plant, like Des Moines is an example. Um, but using some of those filters or small household cleaners, um, people can get better water. Um, you wouldn't think about there being water issues in the United States, but in rural areas where there's a lot of conventional farming specifically, there's chemicals leaching into the groundwater that can cause a lot of health issues. So um, although it was a completely on the other side of the world, they really are dealing with the same problem or a similar problem as what I'm dealing with here in, in the middle of Iowa. Um, and that was just a really cool connection point. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I mean, I think that's really cool that, um, that you were able to make that connection. And I feel like maybe we do know more about the programs of our clients than we think we do. Cause like that, what, what you just explained, it was like very detailed. I feel like there are some clients where I'm like, Oh shoot, wait a second. I don't re know really, really what they do. I got to go do some, some research, but I feel like that was really beautiful how you just shared that about what, um, about what they're doing. So very cool. Thank you. I like that a lot. Um, let's see, what do you think, um, in terms of like the value that our, that our clients get, um, in the work that we're doing around managing their financials. Again, I know you've been with us for just five months. It honestly feels like you've been with us for like minimum two years. Um, and that's a very good thing, but I, I know it's only been five months, but what would you say? Like, have you seen any sort of like transformations in working with clients? Like when they first start working with us and then as they're getting more comfortable around their numbers, as we're getting things cleaned up, as we're, you know, giving them reports that actually are clear and make sense as we're helping them with the strategy, like what transformations have you seen in our clients? I think that's part of the coolest, um, the coolest things that I've experienced thus far with 100 degrees. Um, there's been a couple different clients that have come to us um, almost in desperation and like just mm -hmm. stress and confusion and it, it got messed up and it's been messed up for years and I didn't know it or like I felt like I needed to be responsible for it but I just didn't know what questions to ask and so things were a mess without me actually knowing about it um, and the thing about finances is <clears throat> For us, if we know the underlying balance sheet accounts, as an example, and why things, why transactions are going to different places, we can look into something and figure it out pretty quickly. But if you're not a numbers person and you're not a finance person, you kind of are powerless. And some of the clients that I've worked with have just felt totally powerless to do anything to change their situation. Um, and it's been really cool to come in and spend, you know, Sometimes it's a couple weeks, sometimes it's a couple months to get things ironed out and figured out. But then over time, just like holding their hand, getting some clarification, getting some understanding, and then walking them through like the transformation process, for lack of a better word, to clean things up and get things to a better state. And now there's a couple clients where we've done that with. And our monthly meetings are half an hour now and they're they're feeling confident they're we've worked through a forecast on you know i am going to have enough cash to make it through the rest of the year i thought i was going to be negative next month like actually i'm doing really great um i might not have as much as i want but at least i'm going to be net positive for the year or you know i really feel confident and comfortable to be able to talk to my board about what these numbers mean now um when they might not have had that power um and just understanding and clarity to be able to like take some of the stress off of them which i think is really powerful oh my gosh yeah so powerful i feel like one of the things i talked about a lot is like yeah stop losing sleep like wondering if you're gonna make the next payroll like because I, i've literally had that conversation before like oh my gosh i was so nervous i haven't slept for a month because i'm over or like running paycheck to paycheck basically, or like mm -hmm. donation to donation is, is how they're operating. And so for us to come in and give them that, like, you know, visual picture of their organization, find how they're doing financially, get things cleaned up. I feel like it's just such a sigh of, um, of relief for sure. Um, I've heard that I've heard that too. And that's, yeah, that's so rewarding to me. It's like, yeah, at the end of the day, like 
you know, we are, you know, number crunchers <laughs> or <We're> like bookkeepers, <laughs> accountants, CFOs, whatever you want to call it might not sound like the most glamorous job in the world, but like knowing how rewarding that is, knowing that we're giving, a, you know, a nonprofit organization peace of mind and helping them build their sustainability, which therefore helps them create more of a lasting impact on whoever they're serving. Okay. Like that's freaking powerful. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, love it. Um, that's awesome. Is there any, um, is there any like favorite type of clients or, uh, like, is there any particular mission or cause that you personally are particularly passionate about? You mentioned like the water situation in, um, in the, the countries that, that one organization is working in and tying that into what's happening in Iowa, but is there any other causes that you're particularly passionate about? Not specifically off the top of my head. Um, I, there's a couple different clients who are doing really awesome things. Um, I think one of the coolest parts is seeing how passionate the client is about the organization and mission that they're serving. Um, so not necessarily that I'm super passionate about their mission, but just seeing how passionate they are about their mission is really cool to me. Um, one thing in particular, so I grew up not, well, okay, so I grew up poor. Um, and that situation and that those economic conditions really drove me to enjoy numbers and learn more about finances and get to the place where I'm on top of those and handling those kinds of things on a regular basis. And so I get really excited about organizations, one in particular, who's supporting and encouraging the poor under-resourced people in a, in a rough urban neighborhood. Um, I get really excited about uh, organizations that are supporting students who may be from different backgrounds who might not have the resources to have experiences um, as an option when they're growing up. Um, but yeah, it, it's more about watching passions of other people get encouraged by my work. If that makes sense. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's a really interesting take on it that I hadn't really thought of before. Like another piece of the reward for us is being able to, that is a really good point, actually being able to work with people who are so freaking fired up about what they're doing and so passionate about what they're doing. It's like, it's contagious. You can't help, but like get excited about that and, and want yeah. to support them as well. And I think that that's, you know, I think both in our nonprofit, um, clients and our small business clients, like pretty much everybody, every client that we work with, every leader, is just really excited about what they're doing, whether it's a nonprofit. So serving their, you know, greater community in some way, shape or form, or whether it's an entrepreneur who is like building their dream business. Um, like we get to work with people who are just really excited about what they're, about what they're doing. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Cause I mean, I feel like the clients that we're working with, they're not just like, you know, some random business down the street. That's like, you know, the like tire store, like mechanic shop okay, or, yeah. hardware store or something <laughs> yeah. that it's like, yeah, it's a business, but it, there's like no passion behind it. Whereas like we get to work with really, really passionate people. Um, and that passion like that. is, that passion is contagious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. We want to see them succeed because it's like, you know, because they're so excited about what they're doing. We want to see them succeed as well. So yeah, that's so cool. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, how does it, what's it like working on a remote team? How do you, how do you like it? Um, working on a fully remote team? Cause I mean, you've been working at a local organization and so you've been, um, so the fully remote thing I think is like relatively new or at least pre COVID it's, it's new, right? What, what, is, what do you like? What do you not like about working on a remote team? I, love being on a fully remote team. Um, and part of that is from my, I guess, stage in life. So I have two little kids who are four and five. Um, and my oldest starts kindergarten in a month. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> um, 
And so that very honestly was one of the things when I when I decided I was going to start looking for a different organization to work for than the one that I had previously, I only looked for fully remote positions because I knew I was going to want that flexibility with my life um, moving forward. <clears throat> and I also yeah. really appreciate like my husband and I chose to put roots down in small town Iowa because we love small town Iowa. Um, and we, my husband grew up on a farm. I grew up in a small town and that small town community aspect is super important for us. Um, and in order to, unfortunately, a lot of the major nonprofits um, who can af afford a CFO type position or a finance director type position are located in really big cities. And I just didn't want mm -hmm. that for my, my, my family and my life. Um, and so I went looking for something that would allow us to stay in small town Iowa, but still have access to serving, um, you know, larger, larger organizations, larger um, companies with the skills that I had. Um, so I love the remote team just because it allows me to have passionate work, but also still live where I want to. Um, I will say the remote is, it's a little bit challenging just because there isn't that water cooler conversation, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But a, a really interesting thing that I've noticed, um, and this isn't necessarily more from a remote team, but it's more working with a ton of finance people. Um, I feel like I know and understand my coworkers now more than I ever have in the past. Mm -hmm. So previously mm -hmm. I understood my coworkers and could gel with them on a, on a mission basis. So we were passionate about sustainable agriculture. We were passionate about Iowa. We were passionate about small town or farming, et cetera. But now like I can actually have a conversation with my coworkers and they understand the words that I'm using or have understood like <laughs> situations that I've dealt with, whereas never really have had that before. So um, although it's different and although I think my closest coworker is like, I don't know, over a thousand miles away, I, I yeah. feel more connected to the team than I ever have before. That's so interesting. And I think that's just such a good lesson for, um, other businesses who, you know, maybe pre pandemic were all in person and are kind of struggling with that. You know, there's that, I don't understand it. Cause I've been, I've been working from home for years upon years now. So I don't understand the, like this big push to get everybody back in the office, but I know that it's out there. Like my husband's company, they pushed like a year ago, they were home for, I don't know, 14 months or something. And then all of a sudden it was like, everybody needs to be back in the office on Monday. And we're like, wait a second, but like the company is growing. You're profitable. We've been doing our jobs just fine from home for 18 months. Why all of a sudden do I have to go back to commuting an hour and a half a day and spending all this money on gas and everything. And I, it's just as like out of the principle of it, like that literally makes no sense. Um, so I don't get it, but I know there's a push for companies to bring people back in person. But I think your point about like, listen, where I live is really important to me. And I want to be in a small town, but the job opportunities to allow me to advance my career and grow myself professionally just aren't here. And so mm -hmm. like, I, I feel like as a business owner, we're getting like incredible talent into 100 degrees because we have the, I mean, really the entire world to like source talent from, I'm not trying to like just find people where I live in Buffalo, New York. I'm not just trying to find people in New York city where like the cost of living and salaries are so, 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 so high. Like as a business owner, I have my choice of like literally anywhere. Um, and so, and for you, who's like, yeah, I really love my community and I've chosen to live here, but I also want to grow professionally. Like I just, yeah, I think that the remote job world is just, it's so important. And I feel like we're a better company because of it. And that's why I just don't understand why companies are, um, yeah, I don't understand why companies are like forcing people to come back to work. It just makes people mad and like resentful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I, my sister-in-law has recently dealt with this, just got forced back into the office for no apparent reason. And she actually was, um, was more productive at home <laughs> than ever yes. in the office. And they're, yeah. they're saying, you know, forced collaboration, but asynchronous communication, like Slack and chat and email and Zoom calls 
you can get more done in half an hour when somebody's focused on just that than like, yeah. oh, I think I'll stop, stop by your desk or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. That's so true. And then, you know, you get rid of the, the commute either way and you, you've got that flexibility to, to do what you need to do in terms of doctor's appointments and kid obligations and things like that. And it just like your work just fits into your life in such a better way than being chained to a desk for eight plus hours. I just like, I think about this one job that I had, um, right before I started the business, it was like, it was a finance job at the university and it was very easy. Um, it was not challenging at all. I was like in a windowless office, it was fluorescent lighting. And I had like a 45 commute minute commute either way in traffic. And I, my work took like two hours a day because it was like such an easy job. So I was just sitting there in this like box in this like room oh, with white walls. miserable for like six hours a day. I'm like, what am I doing here? And I got my job done, but I was just like sitting there. Oh my gosh. Like, what is the point of that? Like, let's let people live their lives. So I agree with you. I wish we could, I wish there was a way to more like to inexpensively see each other more than just once a year, but we have here a hundred degrees. We have an annual team retreat in person. So we will, um, we'll see each other in October, which is, coming up soon ish, like three months away at this point. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I wish there was a way that we could do it more often, but it's kind of expensive to bring people together from yeah. like East to West. Coast. Literally so we'll have to, yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we'll have to deal with once a year, but, um, I'm very excited about that. Cause that does just help kind of like forge those connections even deeper. Cause there is, I mean, for all the benefits of remote working, there's definitely be something, something to be said, about being together in person and just sharing experiences live. Um, so yeah. that'd be fun. Yeah. Awesome. Super excited about that. Yes. Yes. Me too. Um, okay. So last couple questions before we wrap up, um, I always like to ask people, what do you do to disconnect from work? Well, I mentioned earlier that I have two small boys who are five and four, um, and it's pretty much impossible to work when they're asking for your attention, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, which I think has been really good for me. I need to learn how to disconnect more um, because my brain is always thinking about stuff that needs to be done both at home and for work. Um, So I need to get better about just turning off and being present with them when we're doing family stuff or they're asking to play Legos or that, but yeah, it's really, it's really difficult to keep working on a spreadsheet when your four-year-old is sitting on your lap with Legos in your face. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I completely agree. It's so funny. Cause I see people on like on Instagram who are like, you know, post pictures of themselves working while their kids like next to them. I'm like, I don't know who's doing that, but I can't do that. I've got like kid hanging them over here, the kid over here, like showing me something they colored. And I'm like, I don't know who is working with their kids around, but I can't, like, I agree. Like I need a total, total separation. I, I can't do both. Um, yeah, it's probably better, better for everyone too. I think like, you know, better for the kids to have mom's full attention and better for you to really be able to, you know, shut down and fully focus on the kids. So I need to be better about not pushing them on the swing while I'm looking at work email on my phone. I need to just put my phone away and push the swing. So yeah, working on that. That's a work in progress. I literally do the same thing. I'm like pushing Noel with this hand. So I like have my phone right (laughs) with the other hand. (laughs) Yep. Like she she doesn't know she can't see I'm pushing her from behind she can't tell I'm like yeah you're ready. You <laughs> exactly. do that too yep. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Susie, thanks so much for chatting with me today. I feel like I got to know you a little bit better and I'm so excited that our listeners got to know you a little bit as well. And Susie is just one of the, um, 16 amazing people that we have on the hundred degrees team. Um, so Susie, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And this was so much fun. Thanks for having me, Stephanie.